Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good afternoon and welcome. Thanks for joining us alumni in today's program. It's a resume workshop with recruiters. I'm Joe McGonigal from your alumni office and uh, delighted to be hosting today's uh, webcast webinar uh, with our guest recruiters. And uh, really glad that you've tuned in. We've got uh, alumni from around the world, 42 different states uh, on air with us today and uh, 37 countries, I think it was, around the world. So it's probably not lunchtime for most of you. And I apologize uh, for the misnomer in the name, but uh, let's get to it. We've got uh, panelists from Wayfair, Netflix, and Samsung Research America joining us today. Uh, and we've got two of the three here in the room with us so far. Um, and they are Stephanie Fackrell, uh, Manager of University Programs and Recruiting Events for Samsung Research America. Kimberly Howell, if you can wave Kimberly, uh, Campus Recruiter for Wayfair. And Walta, say the last name Walta for me. Namarium. Namarium, mm -hmm. uh, Tech Recruiter for Netflix, uh, patching in from uh, the San Jose area today. Uh, these companies employ hundreds of MIT alumni, so there's no doubt that plenty of MIT alumni resumes pass in front of them and their teammates every year. Uh, but we're here today to talk about some best practices for presenting yourself on paper and PDF for prospective employers. Whether you're just a year out of MIT, you're a decade or more out, or you're involved in hiring too and you want some tips for uh, better resume screening, uh, we hope you find today's discussion uh, useful and worthwhile, and we welcome your feedback. A reminder that after our chat with these panelists, we'll invite them to host some brief breakouts to talk a little bit more about the hiring processes at their companies. We sent links for these breakouts to all registrants this morning, so be sure to keep that email handy uh, after the webinar so you can join one of the three breakouts. Throughout the hour, you can submit questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Uh, it should be in your Zoom toolbar. And if you don't automatically see your toolbar, you can drag your mouse across the edges of your screen and you should see it reappear. You can also tweet your comments today using the hashtag MIT alum. Uh, but let's start with having our panelists introduce themselves and uh, tell us a little bit about um, maybe this. Let's open with what's the state of the resume and the overall uh, package of a candidate? Uh, in, in applying for jobs today. Uh, Walta from Netflix, can we start with you? Yeah, so hello everyone, my name is Walta. Um, I'm a tech recruiter here at Netflix. I've been here um, for a little over three years, um, specifically working on hiring for our engineering teams. Um, in terms, the question being um, the state of resumes, is that correct? Correct, yes. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, resumes are super important in, in us being able to at least get a glimpse of uh, candidates that apply to our roles um, on a first basis before kind of deciding whether or not it makes sense to, to move forward and get them on the phone. Um, so they're super important. I think, you know, having a resume that depicts your skills and the work that you've done in a clear, concise manner um, is, is, is important. And I'm really excited to be part of this uh, webinar to, to give some tips and hopefully get some, some insights for folks in, in terms of um, what makes a, a resume exciting. Thank you. Kimberly, to you. Awesome. So I'm Kimberly Howell. I work here at Wayfair in Boston. I've been at Wayfair just about a year now, um, and I've been recruiting for about five years, uh, primarily in campus recruiting. So the last four years or so, I've been focused on campus recruiting, specifically in the technology space. So that, like Walta, that's where most of my experience lies. Um, but definitely really excited to chat with you all today. Um, as far as the current state of a resume, it's not a whole lot to say that Walta has it already covered for us. So thank you, Walta. Um, but really just, yeah, making sure that that first piece of information that we get of you really does a good job telling us a little bit about who you are, not only what you've done and you know, what specific skills you have, but also what you value, you know, the order of stuff that's on your resume shows kind of what is most important to you, whether it's your work experience, your education experience, your volunteer experience, it really gives us that whole picture of who you are as a person and how you might fit into our culture, which sounds really heavy because it's just a piece of paper, 
Um, but it's the first thing that we have to start getting to know you. So definitely important. And uh, we're excited to give you some, some advice today as much as we can. Great, thank you. And Stephanie Fackrell from uh, Samsung, welcome Stephanie. And uh, you. So you were too busy recruiting to uh, I know. I'm join so us. I'm so sorry, I'm a few minutes, minutes late. late. I'm just teasing. <laughs> But Stephanie, we're just starting with introductions. And if you can tell us a little bit about where you think the resume stands in the overall package today. Sure. Um, so I'm Stephanie Fackrell. I work here um, at Samsung Research, um, a subsidiary of Samsung Global. I have been in the recruiting space for about nine years, mostly in university recruiting, both tech and uh, product management recruiting. Um, I love recruiting, love meeting people and seeing what they can contribute to the company. Um, I do agree with my colleagues, uh, Walta and Kimberly, uh, the, your resume is your first impression to us. And um, I do think that you need to be as clear and concise as possible. Um, highlight your most impactful um, recent contributions to the company that you were most recently with and at your former companies. Um, and, you know, if the resume really is a six second of perusal uh, to see if we want to move forward um, with further screening with you. So uh, I do think a resume is great. LinkedIn, we do look at LinkedIn um, for uh, more junior candidates, you know, GitHub, those sorts of things are um, what people are looking at now as well, but resumes still are the number one way to get your foot in the door and for us to screen. Great, and we'll get to some actual alumni resumes submitted today. Uh, we do have uh, alumni, if we don't get to yours, please understand that we did receive hundreds of resumes uh, today. So we will, uh, we will not keep these panelists uh, to all hours on a Friday. But um, if we don't get to yours, uh, there are plenty of resources we can get to at the end of the hour um, that can help you. Um, but before we do that, just a couple other questions. Overall, uh, generally, I'd love to hear your impressions, recruiters. Um, how much credit do your teams give to the look of a resume, the style of it over its content? Uh, and we can go completely uh, yeah, chime in as, as, you, uh, as the spirit moves you. I, for me, I think old school's better. It's the less formatting, the less fancy, the less colors. I mean, unless you're a designer or something like that, I would say stick to the basics. Um, and, you know, formatting is really uh, important if they're, if you're leaving too much space, if the margins, like it's, uh, I think it is worth paying someone <laughs> to help you with a resume if you have questions or at least have someone look it over before you submit it, um, errors, typos, like it really, it again, is your first impression to us. Yeah, for sure. I, I completely agree with that, particularly the errors and typos. I'm always so surprised when I get resumes across my desk that have these big glaring errors as far as, you know, spelling your, the name of your major wrong, I've seen so many times, mostly with psychology, which is a little fair, but <laughs> you know, it's really, really surprising how many times we see glaring typos. So even just having a couple friends look over your resume will help prevent some of that as long as you have a pretty good detail-oriented friend. Um, but yeah, no, it is really important. As far as the style, I could not possibly care less how many colors you use, what the formatting looks like, as long as I can find the information that I need to find. So thing that you want us to know about you, don't hide it. You know, I've seen a couple of resumes more recently where they had these outstanding, you know, four point GPAs and it was in 0.2 font hidden somewhere way at the bottom of their resume and they're a recent grad. And I'm like, put that way more big and bold and let me, let me see what it is that's really gonna be important to this job, job search. So if that's your education because you're new out of school, make sure that's easy to find. If it's your great internship experience or your great work experience, make sure that's easy to find. It's when the formatting gets so busy that I'm not sure where to look is when I start to get a little turned off by you know the, the styles and colors and boxes and whatever have <laughs> in there. 
Yeah, plus one. I would say the content of your resume is more important than the look and the style of it. Like everyone had already mentioned, um, grammar and making sure that that's all, all in check, um, the way that you're describing your work, um, the impact that you've made at some of the other opportunities that you've been at before, I'm more interested in that than, you know, the different colors that you use in the different <laughs> formatting. Um, I think whatever makes it easy for, for everyone who's looking at the resume to be able to kind of dissect all the information, um, that's going to be what's most important. Put it this way, I will never judge a resume for being too simple, but if it's so complex that I can't find information, that's going to put me off a little bit. Thank you. Uh, we've got alumni from you know, dozens of, of uh, fields here from a couple of dozen course numbers at MIT. And uh, they are applying for obviously, you know, hundreds of different kinds of jobs uh, at several tiers of, of uh, experience levels. Um, would you advise to all of them uh, or are there categories of, of jobs they're applying for that you would uh, advise specifically having specific resumes, multiple resumes, having uh, different versions of resumes, uh, depending on uh, you know, their experience or the, the jobs they're applying to, et cetera? Uh, or does one size fit, fit all, in your opinion? Anybody? I would definitely say tailor your resume to the job that you're going after. Um, if you, for example, are a back-end engineer, but you're super interested in front-end and UI work and you've done some in the past, but you're submitting a resume that's very detailed on back-end distributed systems work, I'm gonna look at that resume and think, okay, they're not a great fit for this role because your experience doesn't match what we're looking for. And so tailoring your resume based on the opportunity that you are going after and what you want is actually, that's my advice. That's what I would say um, for folks, um, just so that way you're actually putting yourself up um, in a way that's gonna make it seem really um, uh, positive and really enticing for us to be able to take a look and say, actually, they could do this job and they do have some experience and they are able to kind of show that in different ways. Um, it creates a little bit more work, but hopefully the outcome makes it worth it, so. Yeah, I completely agree. I have multiple versions of my resume as well. You know, you want to make sure that when the recruiter looks at your resume for the job that you've just applied to, it makes sense. Um, so exactly as Walter said, and then somebody also posted in the Q&A if the you know, objective at the top of the resume is still something that you want to include. Uh, and make it make sense. If I look at your resume and it doesn't quite match what you're applying for, then I do think that the objective is important to kind of explain to me why you've applied to something that's a little more out there and a little outside of your experience. But if you're a back-end engineer applying for a job as a back-end engineer, then no, you don't really need the objective at that point anymore. Anything right, else? I just was reading over some of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple of questions about age already, uh, and I, I did want to ask about unconscious bias. Uh, how much are your teams thinking about that these days? I know from the employer standpoint, uh, a lot of companies are working on this from an HR angle, uh, gender blind resumes or, or age blind resumes and so forth. Um, is there anything you, you come across that you could think of applicants could do to minimize, you know, possibilities of bias uh, as recruiting teams look at their, at their work? Anybody want to weigh in? Yeah, for sure. So one thing that I, I personally do on my, my LinkedIn and my resume is I don't include my graduation year. I put that I did graduate from a university and I put my degree and I put the school, but I don't put the year um, for that exact reason. So that really the focus is on my experience and not necessarily how old they you know, did the math and figure out that I am at that point. So that's one way to mitigate it. But honestly, I think overall, you want to include all the experience that makes sense. So if, if you are including experience from back when you were in college doing internships, you can probably cut that out at this point if you have a handful of really important years that you've been doing since then. Um, and same with, you know, your, your older positions. You want to summarize that you've been in the workforce and that you know your stuff and that you have this great experience, but don't feel compelled to keep every single job you've ever had on your resume if you think that's going to kind of show your age and, and give you that concern. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. Same. <laughs> I do think, you know, if you've been in the workforce for 20 years and you've made amazing contributions, I mean, there's no way to hide that. And you should highlight that. I mean, that makes you an asset and a great candidate. Um, so I would always keep your major contributions, even if they were 
20 years ago, inter old internships from college, yeah, so I don't think that matters, but professional contributions, always put those on. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions asking around length of resumes and what makes the most sense. Keep it one page, multiple pages. Um, I always anchor on shorter, um, so one, maybe two pages. Um, I have received resumes that were 25 pages long, and that is <laughs> that's a novel at this point. Um, I think there's a, there's an element of being able to um, success successfully describe um, the impact and the work that you've been able to make in less words and more. Um, and I always anchor on doing that more so. Um, you know, we don't ever want to spend, you know, so much time scrolling just to get all the information that we need. If you're able to kind of put it in one to two pages, that's that's what I would recommend. Um, it just saves time on you and also the individuals that are reviewing it. Um, so we're able to get the information we need in a pretty quick amount of time. Good. Uh, for the next question, I do want to pull up uh, uh, a slide here. And as I'll do, I'll just remind viewers that you um, can join a breakout with e each one of these um, each one of these recruiters at the end of our session today, at the end of our, our webcast, uh, those three links for those three um, breakouts were included in the email you received this morning. Uh, so let me just see if I can get my PowerPoint up. There we go. Uh, and panelists, can you see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let me just ask you about these. Um, uh, you know, recent press, you, you, a lot of press these days about uh, how to AI proof your resume and uh, any insights you can give behind the scenes of what applicant tracking systems are doing these days, either for, you know, at your company or, or at others. Um, how much are we writing for a machine these days and how are our, uh, how, how might we optimize on that or use it in our favor if, uh, if that's the case? I think <laughs> well, recently, Samsung, we have been looking into a lot of AI resume screening companies to help us go through our massive applications. So you are being, I mean, a recruiter like myself, we would do Boolean search. So keywords are very, very important. Um, but yes, AI is getting involved in helping people and companies screen resumes. So Whatever you can do to have keywords, key phrases, um, that is going to bump you up in the AI search to help a recruiter find you. So for over here at Netflix, we actually don't leverage um, these types of AI technologies to review resumes. I think the, the balance I would find with keywords is don't just put keywords on your resume for the sake of putting keywords um, and, and have your resume show up. I've definitely seen some where there's so many keywords and then you kind of read a little bit more about what they're doing and it's not relevant to the words that they put on their resume um, and they're doing it just so that way their resume does pop up. Um, I think for us over here, I personally am the one who reviews resume as well as my hiring managers. And so um, we have a, a more tailored approach in that sense. And um, I think it's more you know focused on actually just putting the, the work that you are doing and highlighting that. Um, but that's kind of how we do it over here. Wayfair doesn't use any kind of AI tool to screen resumes. However, um, as Stephanie mentioned, we do, as recruiters, do Boolean searches. So having the right keywords on your resume is still important. When you're trying to figure out how to integrate that, keep it to, you know, what type of role are you looking for and what keywords are going to give you that type of role. So if you're looking for a project manager role, make sure in your past experiences, you're talking about the projects that you led. You know, call yourself the project manager for X, Y, Z opportunity, and that will make it come up in our search, but it'll look a lot more natural than just listing project manager, project engineer, project, 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 that don't make sense in any kind of context. So make sure the keywords that you want to include for your future role that you're searching for are in your resume, but that you find a way to integrate them very naturally into your past experiences. Thank you. Uh, let's jump into some resumes here and we'll get to some more audience questions. Uh, viewers, please uh, upvote or downvote the questions you like um, too. Uh, how, how should that education section appear? Where should it appear? I pulled a few from the resumes we got. Uh, here's Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's got dates of the degree. It's got the year. Uh, it's got the you know location of the school. Uh, 
all degrees here. In this case, the alum received two degrees uh, listed as one line. Another example uh, listing the more advanced degree first and the undergraduate degree second. Um, a third here, uh, and I saw all three varieties really um, listing, you know, uh, titles of theses, uh, minors, um, fellowships received during the time, and then down to, you know, clubs, groups they belong to, uh, et cetera, squeezing those in all in the education section. Uh, have you seen recruiters? Have you seen any other creative approaches to this? Or is this just a necessary evil to have this on some section of your resume? Uh, any insights on this section? I personally think if you are a recent graduate, that should be listed at the top. Um, because if we're looking for relevant experience and there isn't, if your resume is not as um, meaty, <laughs> we'll wonder why. And if it's your education is at the top, then that tells us completely, you know, new grad, they're just starting out their career. Um, so this is why there's not that much experience. I do think the educational section should be on there, perhaps at the bottom, if you graduated a few years ago. Um, I think, I don't necessarily think there's any right or wrong way to format it. I think, um, you know, theses can probably be be put in a different section like publications or something like that, but not necessarily included in the degree field. But um, again, there's no right or wrong way how to list. Yeah, I, I agree with the point about thesis is that, you know, seeing that in there, first of all, I don't know who that professor is. It's not necessarily related to the work that if, it, if it's not necessarily related to the work that you're applying for, you can definitely bump that into a later section. Um, but overall, still including your education, it, you know, you definitely want to keep it on there in some fashion. Um, regarding, again, the dates, unless you're a recent grad or you think that your perceived date is going to be an asset for you for whatever reason, I would just at this point get rid of the dates. And Walt and Stephanie, I'd love to know if you, if you agree, just to make sure that they don't math out your age. It's really none of their business how old you are. All that matters is your experience. Yeah, I agree. I actually also don't put the the year I graduated from university on my resume either for the same reasons. Um, I'll plus one kind of what's already been said um, in that I would put education actually closer to the bottom, especially if you have been in the industry for a lot longer. Um, for the, the example where there is a thesis listed, um, I would say those are probably helpful depending on the job that you're applying for. I know for us, um, we've got a department here called um, data science and analytics or data science and engineering, um, where they do hire a lot of PhD uh, grads who have done a lot of relevant you know, thesis work and research work. And that kind of information would be helpful, um, whether it's fully listing out your thesis or just linking like your Google Scholar page or things like that. So again, I think it goes back to tailing your resume for the job you're applying for. Um, but yeah, I agree with kind of what's already been said. And definitely if your thesis is published somewhere online and you can link it in your resume, that's always really cool to see if you have some kind of publication you point just right to. Yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, experience here. Uh, specifically, uh, and some questions around this, um, uh, those of us with deep wells of experience. Um, I, I liked this, this uh, excerpt, this is an excerpt from one of the resumes we received, prior experience highlights over the course of, what is this, 15 years almost, um, with, you know, a couple of roles and projects uh, worked on. Are there other creative ways you've seen that approached in, in resumes you've seen for more senior experience, higher roles. I'm just reading this one. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I'm okay, just reading. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can see the screen. I have to be a little honest here and say I don't usually recruit for folks that have a lot of prior experience. So I don't know that I'll have the best advice here. Um, I do, though, like how this is formatted more in like a highlight reel without taking up a ton of real estate from your old experience. Stephanie or Walter, anything to add? Yeah, I agree. I, Sorry, Stephanie. No, no, go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say, I agree. I like that it's kind of broken down in this way. I think feedback that I would probably give is that, so it looks like you've spent, you know, close to 20 or 
sorry, 10 years um, here. And so wanting to know a little bit more about the career progression that you've had in terms of, have you stayed in the same position? Have you grown within the company in terms of roles and opportunities? Um, and then more specifically around kind of the impact and the work that you're doing. Um, I'm seeing a lot about kind of, um, you know, from the sales aspect and the, the delivering of certain, you know, dollar amounts and making that impact. But I'd want to know a little bit more from um, the technical side of things, some of the work that you're doing there and the collaboration pieces. But I do like that it's kind of in one section where you can kind of look at everything holistically and get a good glimpse of just the time that you spent there. Good, thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about design. I, I had to pull some of my favorites uh, and I will stop sharing that and start sharing uh some visual treats uh well i don't want to bias you whether these are treats or not um <laughs> but i'd love your reaction to uh some of the, some of the layout you know the layouts submitted in in some of these resumes were very creative um and non-conventional i'd say um i i will out this uh young man ignacio uh, who submitted this uh, this resume Highlights at the top, and I please recruiters don't feel like you have to read this entire thing to give feedback. But um, I really liked the uh, sidebars over here uh, being a different color. I've seen a lot of sidebars in, uh, you know, being a, a shade off. Uh, and one more visual thing, yes. Yeah, so the sidebar on the second page as well. Uh, any other reactions to that? I can go kind of go through all of these. I picked five of them. Uh, that are kind of non-traditional approaches and alumni, you know, in these fields, please feel free to, to uh, quote unquote, borrow from Ignacio's uh, uh, approach. But uh, here's Kyle, uh, who has, you know, a lot less color, of course, but that two column look, uh, these almost look like LinkedIn endorsements, kind of the software skill set with the various bullets. I'm presuming uh, he's confessing to us he has more strength in Rhinoceros 3D than he does in Unreal. Uh, and, you know, categories of skills uh, next to all of his experiences. Uh, I really do like that being called out, like on this, the skill set side of what they consider themselves an expert in versus they're not as well versed in. I think as a recruiter, that's very helpful for us, especially if we have a team that's looking for really strong rhinoceros 3D skills versus Unity skills. Like I would look at this and be like, he's a great candidate. Um, what else can does his resume tell me about, um, has he utilized rhinoceros in any of his projects? Like that sort of thing. But that calls out immediately to a recruiter, that's the strengths of the software that he has. Yeah, plus one, I do like that as well. Cause I know sometimes when we're working on roles, um, hiring managers might have specific requirements in terms of technologies and language experience that we need for folks. And so just knowing where people are really strong in versus just seeing a list of technologies and tools that they've leveraged without really knowing, all right, was this just for one project or have you been using this for years um, is helpful for us. Um, I also really like with this resume, the use of like action words to describe the work that he's doing. He's talked about how he developed and deployed design guidelines, how um, he's really clear about um, the, the work that he's done and the focus areas that he's really um, uh, put in with a lot of these different opportunities, because um, it really shows just the impact that he's making and not necessarily just kind of on a team and, and the team did this. It's showing that he himself was part of this, uh, these different projects and initiatives. Yeah, I agree definitely the strength indicator on the technical skills is super valuable. I also noticed that Ignacio had done the same thing for his foreign language skills, I like. Mm -hmm. We've got, uh, I, I don't, sorry if I say the name wrong, but uh, Dejana. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, the interesting lesson here, she, she did have a photo above this in the white space, which has not rendered now uh, on Zoom. Uh, Dejana, just to note. But I was showing it as another example of that the two column approach uh, with more minutia on the left and more complete sentences on the right, more um, you know item, itemized lists on the left, and more um, you know full descriptions of things on the right. Likewise, here uh, Henry uh, even has this visual of the the bars down the left hand side uh, for experience in education. Uh, and passions, but that two column approach to the right uh, 
Um, these are not your standard downloadable templates off of <laughs> Microsoft Word or elsewhere um, that I found. But uh, uh, Roy here has uh, logos with his. I was curious what you would think of, uh, of that. I mean, color splash is nice. I like seeing the MIT logo on there. Uh, catches my eye. And uh, finally, I'll just point out, uh, this is kind of how my high school teacher taught me how to uh, write a resume. <laughs> and uh, uh, in my own uh, hiring and, and screening for alumni association jobs in Cambridge at MIT, we still see a lot of these. Uh, so anything to be said in, in general about all of those or in specific about any that I, anything else about those in particular? Well, I'll say my resume looks exactly like that last one. Uh -huh. So as somebody who looks at resumes all day, every day, I still present my resume in this way. And there's a really good reason for that. It's just very clear. Uh, oh, on the photo for Dijana, I never recommend putting your photo on your resume. Um, it just opens the door for, honestly, a lot of a lot of biases that you you know you want to hope that the recruiter and the hiring team isn't considering those factors but when you put your photo right on your resume you're kind of opening that door unnecessarily so i never recommend putting a photo on there and then the one right after Dijana, maybe it was henry before roy yes henry there's just a lot of wasted space on that resume the font is super tiny and he's decided to try to not use like a quarter of the page, which if you were to just format that a little differently, I do like the tilted labels, but he's wasted a lot of space by doing that. I agree. I agree with the wasted space for sure, because perhaps there are, uh, with a li little more space, there's more highlight, uh, more room to highlight um, additional, uh, projects or contributions you've made at these various organizations. Well, this, um, it's, yeah, it's just a little too much wasted space and you could utilize that in a better way. I do have one thing, um, just for me personally, potentially leave your address off <laughs> your resume, maybe just the city that you live in. Um, that, that can factor into, I guess, uh, you know, are you willing to relocate or relocation things or even a bias against a, a location, right? That's unnecessary. Well, I think you can leave, like I live in Los Angeles or I live in Palo Alto, but I think your mailing address, I don't know, maybe for safety reasons, whatever, I would just leave that off. Especially if you're gonna be posting your resume on a job board, you know, Monster, Career Builder, Indeed, what have you, um, pretty much you can get a license to download your resume and then send you all sorts of junk mail or what have you, um, you know, you know, a lot of recruiting agencies will use that as a way to get like sales leads and, you know, all sorts of things that you just don't want to be contacted about. Good. Thank you. Uh, take a little break for questions here. Um, uh, many uh, thank you, uh, crowd for helping upvote these, uh, many recruiters look at past experience to see if there's a match, uh, but it tends to exclude people who are smart and flexible and can learn on the job. Uh, but want a little, want to do something a little different. Uh, is there a way to promote that you might still be a good fit, even if you haven't done this particular thing before, outside of maybe the, you know, just bullet point listing of your experiences and your, and your education? Is there a way to, to promote your, your interest in, trans, using your transferable skills? I guess is the question. That Anyone? one's a hard one, <laughs> because I think it depends on. Say you've been in sales, you know, your whole career, and now you want to be uh, an engineer. Like, there has to be some sort of um, something on your resume um, that says, you know, I've taken these classes, I've I've left this sales job, and I've um, gone to computer science. And I've done these like internships. So there has to be something that gives us, I mean, I love, we love people that are open to trying new things. Like those are great and hireable people, but there has to be something that we can grab onto um, to want to proceed to like give you an opportunity, like to even have a conversation with us. Um, I know a lot of hiring managers 
really like passion and people willing to learn. Um, again, it's just about um, how much background do you have in what you want to switch to. I think there's an element of having taken some sort of initiative in the space that you're really interested in going to, even if it's not what you're currently doing. Um, so my examples that I probably will give throughout this whole thing are very engineering focused since that's who I work with and those are my groups. But um, going back to my example of if you are a backend distributed systems engineer, but you're really passionate about design, maybe you've done some design projects or, or um, done some work on, on things like GitHub and more UI frameworks and things like that, find ways to kind of dive into those um, areas that you're really interested in and put that on your resume or have something to show that you've at least made an attempt to really dive into these areas that you think you'd be a good fit for and you've done some already. It's hard to, to look at a resume and, and see a very mismatched background, but there's nothing to really show us to say like, okay, maybe there's something there. I think you have to do a little bit of work on your own end to, to take some initiative and show that you can do it um, so that we feel comfortable knowing that, okay, this is a little bit different of background, but there's enough here to say, I think it's worth taking a shot on um, and actually kind of proceeding in things um, and see how things pan out. Yeah, similar to what I was saying earlier with the objective. Uh, if I look at your resume and it doesn't really make sense for the job that you've applied for, I'm looking for an objective. I'm looking to understand why you're looking to make that transition. And uh, there are a lot of questions in here about cover letters as well. Um, I don't typically require or review a cover letter, but in this situation where you're making a significant pivot, that's when I would open that cover letter and want to hear a little bit more about your story. Um, understanding too, you know, we're in, in the business here of, you know, trying to better your life. And if we put you into a role that by all accounts, you're, you're not prepared for, um, uh, you, we're going to relocate you to Boston and we're going to give you this great salary. And then in two months, you're going to be let go from the position because it really wasn't something that you had any foundations in. And then you're going to be mad because you're stuck in Boston and you have to pay back your sign-on bonus and you have to do all that type of stuff. So um, we're not just being ruthless when we go through these resumes in that way. We're really making sure that we're setting you up for success as you make this career change. Thank you. And a question, uh about gaps in work, you know, obviously uh, uh, paternity, maternity uh, gaps are a big one, uh, but other, you know, time off uh, for other other purposes. Uh, have you seen creative approaches to uh, phrasing of that in in the objective statement at the top or in in uh, in other ways in the itemization of experience? Another great opportunity to use that objective space. Um, honestly, if, if you're extremely concerned about it, you can be a little more ambiguous with the exact dates where you were in your past employers and be able to tell that story live. Uh, but that's another great, great reason to use that objective space to you know, not necessarily say why you left the workforce, but just to say looking to reenter the workforce in this capacity with these skills. I think it's something that's becoming more and more common too, where people are taking time off to travel or for personal needs. So I've seen that on resumes and I don't negatively, that doesn't negatively impact the way that I view that individual or the person. I think it's totally common and totally fine. So for any of you who have taken time off for whatever reason, don't feel like that's gonna hinder you and your ability to find a new um, role or your next opportunity. I think it's, it's super common and, and it doesn't really negatively affect you in any way. I, agree. I absolutely agree. And I think a lot of companies these days are having um, return to work programs. So if you were um, a mom and you left for three years, like uh, companies are a lot more open and willing to bring people back into the workforce because we want people to succeed. So a lot of companies are having return to work programs for paternity, maternity, um, veterans. So I, you know, I would list it. I, again, I agree with everyone. Um, put it in your objective. You can get creative in the way that you format the resume. And again, um, if you have the opportunity to come on site and interview, we're here, we're human. We want to hear your story and you can go into your story um, when you're here live with us. I, I love this question, and we'll, we're going to get to some a big pile of resumes here in our lightning round. But I have to ask: uh, somebody says, uh, "What about uh, including an incredibly small font?" Or um, <laughs> have you seen other other hacks like this? Uh, you know, all the acronyms that will come up in 
in those automated searches, uh, either Boolean or machine learning wise. Um, and I did see it in some resumes of just that endless bulleted list at the very bottom of a resume. Uh, other hacks like that you've seen on on uh, resumes that are trying to game the system or beat or beat it. And do you recommend any of them? I don't recommend them. <laughs> I do not recommend it. It's a turnoff, you'd say. Yeah. You want us to read your resume. Like it's your first impression to us again. Like if you're trying to game the system, um, you know, what, is, what does that say about you? I don't, you know, I don't know. I just be as honest as possible on your resume. Um, format it in a way where we can read it because we will see it. So, um, just be you, be honest. Yeah, I agree. It comes off a little dishonest when there's just tons and tons and tons of buzzwords. And you don't, you shouldn't need to game the system. If you have the skills and you can back that up, you shouldn't need to put it in this tiny invisible font on your resume. It should just show up pretty naturally in your, your work experience. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, we've got five minutes left. And a reminder to viewers, we'll have uh, short breakouts for 10, 15 minutes uh, after our webinar today in which each of our company panelists, depending on how much time they have, can, can answer some more specific questions from you about their companies and uh, maybe talk a little bit more about the hiring processes uh, at their respective firms. Uh, panelists, get ready for lightning round here. Uh, a necessary evil, given the amount of resumes we saw. But if you would take a look at these, I think I picked 10 uh, resumes. Uh, first positive thing that comes to mind to say, and maybe first thing you would change about it, uh, if you know you had to submit, somebody had to submit this resume tonight for a job. Uh, and feel free to pass too, if, <laughs> if you don't have anything to say. Um, so for Cherie, anything uh, strikes you, give it the six second scan in those six seconds as uh, Cherie's doing the right things here and uh, any quick fixes? I'd probably, I think change formatting. Yeah, I'd probably move the dates um, to the other side just because it looks a little hard to read just doing a quick scan. Yeah. Um, grammar issues that we're noticing as well. How yeah, about date? Sorry, the one jump. more thing on the last one is your most recent job that you've been at for a very long time has like no detail, whereas the other ones do. So add some more there. How about David's? I like the formatting. It's super clean. It's very easy to read. I know exactly what you're into. And I'd be able to make a decision on this one pretty quickly if it matched for the job. Yeah. I also love that he okay. put his GitHub profile and his LinkedIn profile on his resume too. Yep. How about Doug's? Whoa. Any, any? He's very text heavy. Anything he's doing right? I like the subtle use of color. I think when it's like two tone, I think that that's done well. Quick, quick fix? Maybe take some of the bullet points out and just focus on like your key, key strengths. And then you can talk about the other strengths during a phone screen or on site interviews. You also need margins. Yep. Yep. Eric, anything he's doing right or she? Sorry, Eric. I like the format. I like the bullet points. Yeah, it's easy to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is done. Uh, Eric. Oh. Again, you could use some margins. It just makes it easier to read when it's not so cluttered, but the format is very clean otherwise. I think for the, the director job, um, if any of these things can be condensed and key points and takeaways highlighted, um, it does seem pretty wordy um, when it could probably be condensed. One other thing really quick that many, many, many people do on their resumes without noticing is the, the way that he's formatted the dates for each of his past jobs is inconsistent. So like 2009 to 2013 has like a longer dash and spaces on either side and the rest of them don't. That's very nitpicky, but it's actually a super common, very small formatting issue on resumes. 
Yep. And Kang Kim. Kang Kim. I think she or he is doing right. Something about the way this is formatted is feels harder to read and digest. It just looks like one long Word document. I like move the company names over, bold them, highlight them somehow, but everything is kind of like jumbled together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because you were at Raytheon for all these different opportunities, it looks like maybe you've italicized your job title, but I would move those so they're not quite as in line so that it's really clear that you've been like promoted through these steps mm -hmm. instead of the, this was one project and this was another project, which is how it kind of comes off when it's all in line like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Ginger. Quick fixes or anything she's doing right? Again, subtle use of color. I like the subtle use of color. I'm um, slightly confused about what type of role she'd be going for because it starts with software professional and then immediately jumps into business skills. So um, I'd want just a little more clarity around what her career target was, whether it's in software or business. And I would also prefer the experience portion of her resume to be moved up more. So that's the first thing that we're seeing, just to understand your background a little bit more too. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a couple left here. Uh, Cesar, Cesar. No okay. weird date thing with the dashes. He did that as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Recruiters are nifty if you can help. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I would say again with uh, the multiple bullet points, if you can condense those um, to make more sense instead of one line for each thing, um, highlight the most important items and you can talk about what needs to be talked about if it comes up in an interview, um, but you don't have to highlight every single thing. I'd also just give quick feedback around, and I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, being specific about your work to say that you were in charge of this, in charge of that, in charge of this. It, it, that doesn't tell me exactly what you're doing and, and what you've been able to accomplish. Um, so being more specific about your impact versus what you were in charge of or what chair you were a part of and things like that. And the bullets are also, it looks like double spaced or maybe 1.5. There's a lot of space in between them, which isn't necessarily wired for this. It takes up a lot of space where you could fit some more in there. How about Elizabeth? I like it. Looks great. <laughs> <laughs> Any quick fixes? Uh, moving in the interest of time, Eric Cole. There's a photo. No need for the yeah. photo. <laughs> and doing right? I think the transformative fight, that big chunk in the middle, I'm not sure if that might be an objective or he's telling us about himself, but I think um, that can be condensed or moved. Um, again, the management experience is too far down to like catch the eye right away. Also, I would hope that when submitting this resume, the areas of expertise are kind of tailored to whatever fits that that job that you're working for. So that the most important is showing up towards the top of that list and anything that is not really a, a super strong area for you or that is not quite as relevant can be removed depending on the job. Uh, and I lost my slides here, sorry. Uh, I think there was one more. Cesar, Elizabeth, Cole, and Eric. I don't dislike it, but the, just that big, big area at the top again, a lot of yeah. words. It looks like he has his education in there too, which can be broken out into a separate section so that that big top paragraph isn't quite so aggressive. Mm -hmm. Well, our time has come to a close here, folks, and we did not get, uh, I don't think we did justice to those 10 maybe uh, entirely, but uh, some quick hits for them. And uh, I definitely want to thank our panelists for joining us today from Netflix, Samsung Research, Samsung, and Wayfair. Uh, thanks to our alumni viewers for joining us. Do you want more resume critique, more resume discussion? 
um, please visit mi alum.mit.edu slash careers. We have other webinars there for you on resumes. Uh, we have an alumni advisors hub. That's a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring platform and peer-to-student mentoring platform where hundreds of alumni, fellow alumni, have signed up to give you resume advice. Uh, and that, again, is alum.mit.edu slash careers. Uh, once we wrap up again today, uh, we will uh, host three breakouts for Stephanie, Kimberly, and Walta. Uh, they will join them respectively. And all of those breakout links were sent to you this morning in an email uh, because you can't join two Zoom meetings at one time. So you've got to end this one and, uh, and start another one. Uh, we will archive this presentation and it will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel uh, within a week's time. And uh, if you have further comments or feedback about the webinar, please email us at alumnicareers at mit.edu. Uh, so once again, I'll say thank you to our panelists and let's open the breakouts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.